DAs, the elected DAs you heard from here today, are actually members of Prosecutors Alliance. It's an organization that is activating prosecutors and their allies to reform the state and local prosecutorial system. Their barcode is right up there if you just want to snap a quick picture of it. There's 4,000 members in California, and I think they're expanding to other states as well. This is really about changing internal culture and fielding the next generation. And it's a free membership that's open to everyone. So I just encourage folks to, to check them out. They have a great website. And we have a law school division, too. Law school division. I'm sorry? We have a law student division. And there's a law student division, meaning that you can start an organization within your own law school that is Prosecutor Alliance affiliated. So all you folks out there thinking about careers as prosecutors should really consider that. Anything else from? Excellent. OK. <laughs> and and if you ladies, if you'd like to stand up, just in case folks want to approach you afterwards to ask any questions. <laughs> and thank you for coming, and thank you for being such a good partner to the law school. So it is my honor, honor, honor to introduce State's Attorney Kim Fox. She is the top prosecutor of Cook County, Illinois, which encompasses Chicago. She has jurisdiction over 5.4 million people, and she runs the second largest prosecutor office in the United States. She's responsible for 800 attorneys and over 1,700 legal staff. Kim Fox first ran for office in 2016. She was part of a wave of progressive prosecutors who were running on platforms that included policies like diverting low-level offenders, eliminating cash bail, looking at second look sentencing, and very near and dear to my heart, taking a very hard look at wrongful convictions. She actually expanded the existing integrity unit in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office by a magnitude of 10, and to date, they have exonerated, I mean, this is just a remarkable number. They have freed 220 people. We've heard from different DAs with different philosophies, and Kim Fox's philosophy, I think is safe to say, is a progressive one. And she's going to talk to you today about her vision and her priorities much more eloquently than I could ever describe, but I will say that she cruised to re-election in 2020, and the voters are standing behind Kim Fox and her policies. And I think one of the reasons why, and I've gotten to know Kim a little bit over the years we met in 2018, is because she's very vocal about telling truths, not just about communities and their needs, but also about herself. She's incredibly relatable. And she's not shy about explaining that her philosophy really comes from her lived experience. So for example, she's been vocal about her upbringing, about the fact that she's a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, that she lost a cousin, to gang violence. She is a guardian ad litem for two children, so she's now the mother of four. Um, her life experience really is part of who she is and how she does her job, and we're gonna hear about that. And I also wanna say that Kim Fox is incredibly brave. It's interesting, I was looking at the first panel this morning and I couldn't believe how diverse it was. Just five, 10 years ago, that would have been impossible. It wouldn't actually have been something that we could see in this country Black women elected prosecutors were virtually non-existent in the United States, and Kim was on the vanguard of that. And I think it's really important to acknowledge not just how hard it is to be on the vanguard, but also this very specific challenges that prosecutors of color and women prosecutors face. And when there's that intersectionality, you are subjected to death threats, to a kind of veiled and not so veiled bias, and to criticisms that other public elected officials mostly don't have to face. I think more than once today we've heard from DAs who run, won and, who run and win on a variety of platforms about how hard it is to do their jobs. It really is. Being a prosecutor is one of the hardest jobs I can think of. And to do it, and to do it well, particularly when the path has not been trod for you, when you don't quote unquote look like what people think about when they think of a quote traditional prosecutor, takes extra strength. And I just want to say, that I have so much admiration for Kim Fox because she is really strong. And part of that strength, as you'll see, is that she's not shy about the fact that being strong also requires at times being vulnerable. 
And so with that said, it's my great pleasure to introduce S.A. Fox. After her remarks, she is going to be taking some Q&A, and I will be handling that part of it. Welcome, Stacey Kearney. So I'm probably going to sit. I want you all to see me um, before I sit down. And I'm, I was talking to my chief of staff, Allison Miller, who is here with me, um, for any of you who would like to give us your resumes um, or take our cards, because we are here recruiting as well. Um, you know, when I give lectures, I, particularly when I talk to students, I try to be as candid as I can be. And so sometimes that requires me to be comfortable, because when you're standing here and your shoes are on, you're like, I, I'm tired. Um, so I'm going to give you the fullest version of myself, which will require me to be seated. So, can you see me in the back if I sit down? You can. Cool. So, Lord, thank you for that introduction, and thank you um, to the school and the symposium team for inviting me to participate. Uh, it is daunting to come into a room where you see so many of your colleagues who you respect and admire on a panel and then come from a whole different state and talk to your constituents. Um, and so it, it means a lot that you believe that I have something to offer in this conversation. Uh, the, there's a title that I put for what this lecture would be about, and I will be honest with you that when I was told, you know, you need to tell us what you're going to talk about, I didn't have an eloquent way of saying um, that the criminal justice system and, and the role of prosecutors um, is the evolution of who we are um, requires us to speak hard truths about where we have been. And the level setting of using George Floyd as a talking point because it seems that for a moment in time there was universal agreement that our criminal justice system was inherently flawed and it wasn't coming just from the far resource recesses of communities that have been directly impacted, but that the world had seen how horrific our systems and the roles that they play in our communities have been. And my voice is cracking because I gave them the title of that speech, this speech two weeks ago, and in moments, the video of the brutal beating of Tyree Nichols will be released in Memphis, I am told that it is horrific. I am told that there is a bracing that our communities must do across the country for what will be evidenced once again. I am gratified, if that is such a word, that there is some measure of accountability and that the officers have already been charged. But it is something. It is something to have had a universal understanding about these inequities and about the brutality and about a system that has not really been accountable to the communities that we serve, to title it two weeks ago and to add yet another name and to brace ourselves for another video. And what I hope is not to brace ourselves for a full conversation about what needs to happen in order for us to address these issues and the role of the prosecutor. There's a role to be played. And so the conversation this morning was very riveting. And I must acknowledge um, my gratitude to, to DA Gascon, who has been a friend of mine since he was the DA here in San Francisco, who when I first got into office sat and talked to me about the challenges that he faced coming in and trying to have a reform agenda. But when he said that we have to tell the truth, and he said it repeatedly, my initial thought was, damn, you stole my speech. Um, <laughs> because I'm here to tell the truth. And the truth is not, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. It's not eloquent. It's not, it's, it, it, it's, it is what it is. But if we aspire to have a criminal legal system that is legitimate and credible, then we have to tell the truth. So who am I? I am Kim Fox, I'm the Cook County State's Attorney. I am the first black woman elected to this role. I'm the first black person elected to this role in Cook County's history. Cook County is the second largest county in the country, second only to LA County. Cook County has um, a 
About 30% of our population is black, about 30% of our population is Latino, and about 30% of our population is white, um, with a, about 7-8% seven, seven, of our population being Asian and other. I give you those numbers because 76% of the people who are locked up today in the Cook County Jail are black men, 76%. In our juvenile detention center, 90% of the young people in the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center are black. 90%, nine out of 10. I tell you this, Cook County is known as the false confession capital of the United States. Cook County for the last six years, five years, has exonerated more people than any place in the country. It doesn't feel good um, to continue to lead I guess it feels good in that we're in Tiffany to do the right thing, but I can tell you the 220 people who have had their cases um, thrown out of the 240 plus, because some had multiple cases, cases that have been vacated, not just through our Conviction Integrity Unit, but through our Post Conviction Unit, is just scratching the surface. Then in 2017, we were, Cook County was the first, if for the first time, had a mass exoneration of 15 people who were wrongfully convicted by a corrupt police sergeant named Sergeant Watts. This past August of 2022, we did the first ever mass exoneration of murder convictions. There's been a lot of conversation about nonviolent violence. We have a detective, a Detective Guevara, who has been known for years in many circles and cases defended by my office, his behavior, who was planting evidence, fixing identifications, in essence, doing whatever it needed to do to get a conviction to the tune of at least by many counts, 60 people who may have been wrongfully convicted for murders, for murders. Cook County um, is home to my beloved city, city of Chicago. You may have heard of it um, a lot. And the history that allows a Guevara who ran roughshod over the Humble Park community, which is a largely Latino community, and he was able to commit his crimes in the late 80s and 90s, and I say he, Detective Guevara, committed his crimes in the late 80s and 90s during a time period when the city of Chicago was facing violence um, at historic levels. In 1989, I was a junior in high school, and one of my friends was shot and murdered at a party he was one of 872 people who were killed in Chicago that year. In 1990, there were 900 plus people who were killed. In 1991, over 900 people killed. During that same time period, there was a commander named Commander Burge, John Burge, who worked uh, out of the South Side, which is a predominantly black community, and he and his fellow officers were called the Midnight Crew. And the Midnight Crew used torture to elicit conf confessions from a number of black men for murders that happened in the district. Now, I start there about the history of our beloved city because we're talking about what we're trying to do in moving forward, but history is important. Context is important. Having conversations about criminal justice reform without talking about what we actually need to reform is fake. The reason that John Burge, and Detective Guevara, and Sergeant Watts, I'm going to tell you about who Sergeant Watts is for a moment. Sergeant Watts was a black police uh, lieutenant, or a black sergeant, who had a crew that was shaking down people in the Ida B. Wells public housing projects. Um, these were people who had had previous arrests for drugs or guns, and Sergeant Watts and his crew knew who they were knew who they would be perceived as in the criminal justice system and victimized them to the tune of over 200 convictions of Sergeant Watts having been thrown out because he knew who they were and he knew how the system would handle them. Now, I talk about these detectives and it would seem like we have a policing problem in the city of Chicago. And I think again, we have to be honest and I, I, I will, will tell you, I've been listening about how we address the issues of policing. And I can't be kind and nice and gentle and sweet about it. It's fucked up. I'm sitting down. Um, 
And it requires us to tell the truth. But here's the thing about it, whether it's Sergeant Watts, Detective Guevara, or Commander Burge, the convictions that they received, the men and women who were the subject of their wrath received, police officers didn't go in court and try those cases. It was prosecutors. It was prosecutors who had defendants come into lockups with their faces intact and left with bloodied eyes. It was prosecutors who received reports from Sergeant Watts that were copied and pasted from reports that they had seen over and over and over again. It was prosecutors who knew that Detective Guevara somehow magically was the only one out of his district that could solve any homicide case that others couldn't solve. And that despite the fact that there might be some issue or some question about the identification or the tactics that were used, the conviction is what mattered most. And so the complicity of prosecutors with police, as my colleague Jeff Rosen said, we're, we're police law enforcement adjacent. In Cook County, we weren't adjacent. We were complicit. We were complicit. And the reason, again, that they were able to thrive in their actions, and there was this level of complicity, was because violence in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, as I just described to you, in our city and our county was high, and people were afraid. And there was a sense that when fear starts to take reins and the othering of folks who bring that fear, most people will then say, do what you have to do to keep us safe. It's why in 1988, when there was a presidential election, Willie Horton changed the trajectory of conversations around criminal justice in a presidential election because of the fear of crime. It is 2023, and the fear and perception of crime is at the forefront of our conversations. And it is why a mere two and a half years after the murder of George Floyd, that the whiplash of conversations around criminal justice reform has been dizzying even by American standards. And when I say about American standards, I'm gonna say some other things that we know to be absolutely true. That there have been injustices in this country, whether we are talking about chattel slavery, and let's just widen it. And the abolition thereof, and then the reformation of ways that we could indoctrinate slavery back into our lives. We get through Reconstruction, and folks are able to try to make a, ma a way for themselves, and that gives way to Jim Crow. And then that gives way to where we found ourselves in the 60s looking at the Civil Rights Movement, that then gives way to what we're looking at in the era of mass incarceration. America is nothing if not consistent. But usually, we need some time, some space, a decade or two. George Floyd was murdered in 2020. And people were blacking out their Instagram pages and saying justice for George. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was introduced, there was conversations about the reallocation of resources into communities that have been impacted by violence and injustice. And then two weeks ago, a new Congress is sworn in and one of the top priorities of this new Congress is to address woke prosecutors. Woke prosecutors. I think I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> For all of the things that Laura described about the work that we've been doing in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, many people know me for the non-prosecution of a, what I would consider a C-list actor for a non-violent offense. You know who he is. For two years, two years, there is breathless, endless coverage of one Jesse Smollett in the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times. There was a special prosecutor who was appointed to investigate whether or not the Cook County State's Attorney's Office had done a deal with Mr. Smollett that was unfair because 
he was charged with our lowest level felony, one step above a misdemeanor for lying about a crime that he committed against himself. Now you would say to yourselves, because you get to live here in California and there's a level of distance, that sounds silly. Two years, special prosecutor, millions of dollars? In a county in which you just described that hundreds of men and women went to prison for crimes that they didn't commit, where there is a torture center that has been established in our communities to pay homage to those who were the victims of John Burge, you mean to tell me that there was more time spent talking about the kid from Empire? Why? Because we have, <laughs> I believe, in this moment of reckon reckoning around our criminal justice system, the people who speak the truth about it, and particularly those, and I'm very grateful that Laura said it, who come from the impacted communities, the silencing becomes really important. I grew up in Cabrini Green, one of the toughest public housing projects in the entire country back in the 70s and 80s. You all are so young, you don't know. Um, Candyman? Y'all seen Candyman? Yes, that was taking place in Cabrini. For our, our more seasoned folks in the room, good times? <laughs> Dynamite? Okay. That's where I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And part of the reason I talk about where I grew up and I'll talk about the work that we've been doing, because Laura said it um, so eloquently, I'm unapologetic that the basis for my policies comes from my lived experience unapologetic about that. I'm unapologetic that my lived experience as a young black girl living in one of the poorest public housing projects in the country dictates how I view the power and responsibility that I have as a prosecutor and why I encourage everyone to look at the field of prosecution and the impact that you have. I usually tell people my bio and there's an inevitable thing that would happen. My mother was 17 when she had my brother. She was 18 when she had me. My father was not present. As Laura said, I'm the survivor of childhood sexual abuse. My mother suffered from bipolar disorder, but in the 70s and 80s, and with a green card, which was a government assistant card, the access and availability to mental health services was non-existent. My mother self-medicated by the use of marijuana almost daily, occasionally, she engaged um, in the use of heroin and cocaine. My mother, knowing that we would not have the same access to resources as others, moved us from Cabrini Green despite our poverty one mile north to a neighborhood called Lincoln Park, which back in the 70s and 80s was more affluent. It is one of the most affluent neighborhoods in the city of Chicago today. At Lincoln Park, I went to a magnet school where they taught foreign languages from the time that you entered kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. I was deemed a gifted student. And so I had access to the best of the best that the students who lived in, in Lincoln Park had. And I'd go to school, started since third grade. I'd go to school in Lincoln Park, and my grandmother would still have to babysit us, and I would go back to Cabrini. I would see and know as an eight-year-old the absolute disparities in how every function of our government worked and who we deemed to be worthy of quality housing, access to health care, access to mental health care, food, education. I watched it. I lived in two worlds at the same time. I became fluent in coded racism. I became fluent and knowing what to say and how to say it in order to survive in these different sects. And so I grew up with that knowledge and understanding that yes, I had a cousin who was killed and I had a cousin who went to prison, that I knew the people who were selling drugs in our neighborhood because there was no economy in the Cabrini neighborhood. We were so starved for resources, we barely had a grocery store. The school that I went to before I went to LaSalle Language Academy was called Sojourner Truth. And it was one of the most underperforming schools in the city today, today. And I know that you, I'll get to the policy stuff, but I think we have to tell the truth about crime and violence. 
In the 70s and 80s, the concentration of violence in Cabrini Green was unfathomable. These were towers with poverty literally stacked on top of each other, stacked concentrated poverty in concrete buildings where children had no access to places to play. The buildings were raised in the early uh, 2000s, and now, right up the street in Cabrini, where we didn't have access to groceries, there is an iFly on the block. Have you heard of iFly? iFly is an indoor skydiving place. The neighborhood is so flush with resources that they have a place for people who want to have the sensation of jumping out of planes from a building in the neighborhood where you couldn't provide the basic resources for the people who lived in public housing. I start with that and that part of the bio, and I should also say when we lived in Cabrini, I mean, we lived in Lincoln Park, we could not afford it. I moved from the age of or eight until I graduated from high school every year, save for six months when I was homeless in high school. And went to school and went to work and went to shelter, to shelter, to shelter. And so when I hear people talk about the origins of crime and violence and how we approach our responses as prosecutors, as those in the criminal legal system, and they leave out these pieces of governmental institutions that feed into our criminal legal system and then pretend that we, as prosecutors, wear the white hats and we're going after the bad guys, without trying to establish where the villain origin story comes from. My villain origin story was just that. And when I tell people that how I grew up and the things about my mother and the homelessness and all of the things, the first thing that they ask me is, oh my gosh, how did you make it? How did you make it? That's really inspiring. How did you make it? And then you recognize that that question is based on the supposition that I was supposed to fail. Because we know that those factors, those criminogenic factors that I just described, about my abuse, about concentrated poverty, about family that was struggling on the margins, is the makeup of most of the young black girls, Latino girls in our criminal justice system. I am no different than they are. I'm lucky. And so as a prosecutor, I believe that that lived experience and why I take the time to talk about it because the policies are the policies. Yes, we have legalized marijuana and have worked with organizations that have started here in California about automatically vacating convictions for those who previously got convictions for marijuana possession. That was rooted in my mother's use of marijuana. We could talk about the fact that I stopped prosecuting people for driving on suspended licenses on trafficking, on traffic issues because I remember when my mother's car got booted. We can talk about my advocacy for bail reform and Illinois was the first state to legally, um, by state legislation, eliminate cash bail on January 1st of this year and I was one of only two prosecutors out of 102 um, who fought for that legislation to be passed because I knew people who held fish fries on Friday nights trying to save up money to get somebody out of jail. Because to the young woman who asked about low-level offenses and wrongful convictions, I also knew that for those people who were in jail who couldn't afford to get out, that they would plead guilty and get probation or get something small because it was better than being in jail. And so it is absolutely pervasive that we have a number of wrongful convictions for low level offenses because people made the choice of do I stay in custody or do I go take care of my child? I know this to be a fact. It is also why I know that Ju uh, Sergeant Watts was able to plant so many guns and drugs on folks because yes, we went into court as prosecutors on those cases, 90% of those cases were pled out. And what does it feel like 10, 15 years later to vacate the convictions of people who pled guilty to things that they didn't do that weren't murders? These were drugs, the bread and butter of most prosecutors' offices. 
It's the reason we stop prosecuting low-level drug offenses. And by, by when I say low-level, it feels comforting to people who are listening, or to the FOP at least. Um, because what we recognize, you know, and I, I acknowledge, I was getting a little heated this morning, is that we cannot in the same breath tell the truth about the fact that we know substance use disorder, like the very crux of it is that people who are in the throes of substance use disorder don't care if you lock them up. Does anyone have someone in their family, in their lives, who've been addicted to substances? And you watch them lose their family, their houses, their children, they're standing in the community, and you think a conviction is going to like do it? That's the whole nature of it. The bottoming out isn't sitting in someone's jail. What it does, though, is get them that conviction and then the next one and then the next one. And by the time that maybe they have worked this out, their ability to get a job and housing is done. When George talked about, or D.A. Gascon talked about do no harm, it is taking a surgical approach to the use of the tremendous power that we have as prosecutors and not breaking every bone to get to the smallest. That my policies as a prosecutor, which you could read about, right? Uh, you could read about them, Laura. <laughs> There's a great book about them that Emily Baseline wrote um, <coughs> called Charge. See, I did that. Um, but a policy discussion is not why you asked me to come, I don't think. I think it is the conversation that we have is what is our role as prosecutors, as lawyers, as people who have been a part of this system that has been complicit in the disruption of so many lives under the guise of keeping us safe under the guise that we are the good guys. And back when I came into the office, I was a prosecutor. I served in the state's attorney's office for 12 years before I left. And one of the things that they tell you when you come in is like, yeah, we wear the white hats. We are the good guys. And then you look around the room and most of the people there don't want to go to the very neighborhoods where we see the instances of violence happening. That we are the good guys and that it is our job to like not make waves when our partners in law enforcement engage in behaviors and practices and yet are fundamentally shocked when the very neighborhoods that need us the most trust us the absolute least. And it is not some kind of mythical thing that we don't know why they don't trust us. They don't trust us for the very reasons that I and my lived experience don't trust it either. I'm not here to, to as my kids would say, cape for a system that from the outside I watched harm. As a young assistant, I watched harm. And as the lead prosecutor of the second largest prosecutor's office in this country, I reckon with every night the harm that we cause under my name. So why do it? Because we need people especially now, with a fierce urgency to tell the truth about where we are and where we've been. And the fierce urgency of it because I see us repeating history at rapid pace. I see the conversations in prosecutors' races right now about crime and violence. We have a mayor's race going on in Chicago. The only thing they're talking about is crime. Despite the evidence that we've been in, you may have heard, a once in a generation pandemic that shut down our economies, that sent people into their homes, that had an impact on mental health, the, it was real. And somehow the conversation has morphed away from that we've been through that, that crime is running rampant and we must do something different, which will get us back to the same policies and practices that allow for an anything, convictions by any means necessary mentality that we've seen in the 80s and the 90s. That the urgency of now requires us to not have gentle conversations with our partners about doing better. That the urgency of now requires us that when we see an injustice happen, that we move swiftly, that we be transparent, that we are honest with those for whom we serve. 
and that we are brave. That it is difficult. And I have less than one minute before I take your questions, but I do want to talk about what it looks like to do this work as a woman and as a black woman. As I said, I was the first ever elected in Cook County, and before I even took the oath of office, I was deemed anti-law enforcement. There was a police union blog that dubbed me Crimeisha, Crime Isha. Kind of cute, stupid. Um, <laughs> my mere presence and existence without me having to say a word was deemed illegitimate and not credible because I did not come from the places in which those who sat in my seat came. I received more death threats after Jesse Smollett got a deferred prosecution than at any point in my time in office. It says something that when you can vacate the convictions of hundreds of black men and women and get little fanfare, but not send one black man to prison, that that's the disruption of the system. The urgency of now requires us to have bold leadership, not just at the top of our office, but in the front lines, to ask the questions of, do you feel good about what you have done? Did you say the thing that needed to be said? Do you have the freedom and the space to do that? And I think this generation, more than any other, and the things that you have seen in the course of the last two years have made you beyond well-equipped to do that. Don't cede the space to the defense. We need strong public defenders. We need strong defense lawyers. But you don't even get a defense attorney until the state's attorney's office, in Cook County at least, approves that charge. Don't simply respond to the actions of the state. Use the power of the prosecutorial discretion, that is our superpower, to unapologetically and unwaveringly do the right thing so that we don't repeat history, so we don't have that whiplash, that the post-George Floyd, post Breonna Taylor, and sadly today, the post Tyree Nichols landscape becomes real. I'll take your question. I can stand up at this point. Don't be shy. <laughs> so at this point, we would love for folks to just come up with questions if you want to right here. I can just take one at, one at a time. Reiterating Professor Moran's rule, uh, rule, which is the question should have a question mark at the end of it to be an actual question.
great question.
Um, and I hear you talking a lot about telling the truth and kind of your experience a bit about, um, you know, being portrayed as uh, not, not credible or, um, you know, just some of the experiences that you have expressed with us. So I guess my question kind of pertains to how do you stay true to yourself in this profession given all of that, um, you know, kind of not necessarily backlash, but these perceptions and um, basically also how do you pick and choose your battles? Um, because I find kind of to correlate to this point regarding um, education, um, you know, I went to an all African American elementary and middle school um, that I was grateful to, you know, be able to go to. And then transferring um, to high school, it was predominantly Latinx and African American. And then going to UC Irvine um, was a completely different experience. Um, and then coming to uh, USF is also a completely different experience. And I see the transition from um, in higher ed and then the further up you go and you know how that affects you. And I, I want to stay true to myself and I have been. And I just kind of want to know how do you pick and choose your battles uh, without losing, and how can you, I, I just want to say thank you again for being here, because it's <laughs> so much to me. We don't get to give me spaces. 
And the people who've gotten in these spaces and have comported themselves to a narrative and a patriarchy and a system of supremacy that will seek to oppress us, I can't do it. Every battle ain't the one. Sometimes you just gotta say a prayer for somebody under your breath. But your presence is absolutely necessary for the next person who comes from a neighborhood just like the ones when you grew up in, for you to have policies in place to make sure that they and their children are protected. You'll know. You'll know the chaos. You're welcome. We have time for one more question. Oh, I just also wanted to thank you so much, uh, just for all this. And um, it's such a breath of fresh air. You walked in here. And, uh, I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of man. Let's just say it like that. But um, you said the man. Yeah. He's okay to the man, not the man. He's okay to the man. But um, no, I just wanted to, it's not so much, and I'm just curious about uh, what is your relationship kind of like high dollar or white collar crime and what the, the pattern that you might be facing? Um, because I think uh, there might be, I don't know, I'm just curious. Yeah. So historically, our office, like I said, we, we primarily do, we do criminal and we do civil. Uh, most people don't know that. We also are, we are the civil litigation lawyer for the county of Cook. Um, so of the 800 lawyers, if we're fully staffed, we have about 850 lawyers. Um, and of those, about 150 are do civil work. And so in our civil practice, there's some work that we can do around companies and businesses who um, are engaging in practices that they should. In white collar cases, historically, the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District does that. Most of our criminal work literally is around um, state level crime. We are looking and had been looking, and it's one of the things that I certainly hope before my term ends around issues related to wage theft, and particularly the impact that it has on uh, communities um, that have already are also impacted by crime, or also impacted by a low wage job, and then having corporations. Um, steal from them without any oversight or insight. Um, and so we're looking into that, but historically our bread and butter is on um, violent crime and uh, state level crimes. But our state level statute for white collar crimes sucks. It, it shouldn't surprise you. Um, and our wage theft ordinance was just modified, I want to say three years ago, after a lot of pressure um, from labor, but it came. Um, it is not something that enough time and attention, and I will own that um, from our office if there's been into it. Thank you so much. I think we should rise again.